Today, as we come to the table... Mark, how do you know America repented? How many slaves do you know in America? America repented. We were guilty. We were guilty before God. We were guilty before man. But we've repented. And now we need to be moving forward in the upward call in Christ, not pretending the problems aren't real, not being sensitive to our brothers and sisters and different issues that come up. We have to be honest about this. But at the same time, is America to live forever unforgiven? Let me turn it another way. What if I said, look, I know you came to the Lord, but you'll never be forgiven. I'm going to hold that against you forever. Would that be biblical? No, the Bible says when somebody has forgiveness, what do you do? You forgive them. Our country, as well as many others, has a shameful history of sin against God in the form of slavery and general oppression of people of color. Through the fiery trial of civil war, as well as the brave leadership and sacrifice of those who stood up for civil rights throughout the years, we've made a lot of progress, and as a nation, we've repented of that sin and are moving towards honoring God through justice. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark will remind us that when we genuinely repent of sin, God will forgive. This doesn't mean we won't experience consequences in this life, but His forgiveness is the beginning of healing. Now, here's Pastor Mark in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 as he continues his message, Encouragement in Persecution. We're all made from dust, every one of us. We all came from Adam and Eve. We all have the same mother and dad. That's interesting. Now, DNA, they can actually do this. They can trace back the genetic line to two original people that this all started. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, we know that. We didn't, have to do, we didn't have to get to a point scientifically where the genetics, as I say, science is slowly catching up with the Bible. It is. I mean, if you watch the news, you'll see that science catches up. It's, a much, it's far behind the Bible, but it's catching up. But when, the Bible, when, when science catches up, we look at the Bible and go, we could have told you that 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, because God told us. And we're his family, and we believe his word, and we know his word. And that's our authority, and that's what we stand on. And yet, the world doesn't know that, but we do. Listen to what it says in Galatians 3.28. I know we covered this a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to read it again because of Paul's reference here to these brethren that were of a different race, if you will. He says, there's neither uh, neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, the reconciliation has already been done. Again, the world's not going to know this, but we do as we said. And we realize what's going on. They don't. But here's the bottom line. We need to be a witness to the world. The world's not going to see it without God, but we can be God's, you know, picture, snapshot for the world. When they watch how we love each other among all peoples, all backgrounds, all races, when they see us doing that, the world's going, how do they do it? How come they're not fighting? How come they're not doing this? Because the love of Christ. It's not because we're better. It's not because we're smarter. It's not because we figured some formula out. It's just the love of Christ. That's all it is. Because I want you to recognize something else. Listen, there's a much bigger thing going on here. What we see with this black-white issue and all the other issues is happening around the world. We've talked about this uh, recently. This is a much larger spiritual issue than just issues that need to be worked out with mankind. They need to be worked out. But this is a spiritual issue. Remember, have on your spiritual glasses. The Bible said these things would be happening in the last days. And God gets very, Jesus got very specific about some of the things we should be watching for. But remember, the ultimate goal is this world leader out of Europe to take the world over. The Bible talks about the Antichrist rising up out of Europe. And again, bringing all the answers in, all the solutions, all the walls being broken down, all these kind of things that are going to sound really great to the world. He'll have all the answers because it's supernatural stuff coming to him from the enemy, if you will. And he's going to be working with the enemy to lead the world and to deceive the world. And there's this whole, uh, you know, process going on as far as just kind of changing the world. It's not just changing America. There's, believe me, there's a goal right now to change America into a different country. And there's a goal to change the world into a different world. And I've warned you this was coming. America's going to have to change at some point. I hope it's after the rapture. 
But the world has to unite as one, and there can't be walls up that block the world from uniting. And the Constitution, in many ways, kind of gets in the way of the world. You know, really right now, the world is really ready to join as one. Has anybody noticed that the world, except for America, is pretty much ready to join as one? They really are. Look at Germany. Look at all the major countries. They right now would join together as one and say, let's just all be one big economy, one big world. That's what the Bible says is ultimately going to happen. Prophecy tells us that. Daniel, Revelation, other places. But what is the major roadblock to that? Right now, it's America. Now, God's the one doing it. I'm not saying America's great and we're so moral and we're doing perfect. So I'm saying God is stopping it and he's using our nation at this time because we're kind of in the way. But that means there's going to be a real push by the spirit of Antichrist in the last days, as the Bible talks about, to again neutralize America as much as possible as a force so we can be kind of blended into everyone else. Now, how that's going to happen, I don't know. But you need to recognize what's happening with your spiritual glasses. You know, it's interesting. This week, maybe you saw this with all the statues being pulled down and the different things that are happening. And this is happening with all colors. This is not anything racial here. All groups are pulling statues down. This is a, is a, there's a lot of politics going on behind the scenes here. But it struck me as interesting, this week they began to talk about tearing down the white statues of Jesus. Maybe you saw that. Of course, because they were saying that white shows the preeminence or whatever the case might be. But here's the thing about that. We have to realize, guys, listen, it's not just going to be statues of a white Jesus. It'll, be, it'll eventually be statues of anything spiritual other than the Antichrist. The Bible says the Antichrist is going to pull everything down, everything and make the whole world worship him. Listen to what it says about the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 says this about the Antichrist. It says, he is the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So it's not about whether it's a white Jesus or a black Jesus or a brown Jesus or whether it's Buddha or whether it's Muhammad or whatever. He's going to pull everything down. They're all coming down at some point because he's going to be exalted as the one that sits alone until God comes back to judge him. Now, it's interesting. Again, I want to just say this, too, because we know this as believers, but you need to also need to know this And as far as you when you're sharing with others or if this comes up because... Again, there seems to be kind of this big thing about what color Jesus' skin was. Guys, I want you to know this. It doesn't matter what color Jesus' skin was. His skin didn't save you. All that matters is his blood. And his blood was red. And it flowed on a cross after nails were driven into his hands and his feet. And if you confess your sin, there's room for you in the kingdom of God. You're welcome today to be forgiven and be welcomed into the kingdom of God. But Satan is always about getting it about earthly issues, getting it about fleshly issues, pitting man against man, pitting person against person. Jesus said, listen, I think the reason we don't have any pictures, he didn't come at a time where pictures could be taken or any real drawings taken. He didn't want anybody to know what he looked like because then everybody would say that's what you're supposed to look like. You know, we are as people. He simply said, you know what? I want you to look like me on the inside. I want you to look like the father. And if you'll believe in me and and put your faith in my blood, you will be. That's what matters. It's about the blood. And that's got to be the issue of the church. Nothing else, not any other color, just that color of the Lord, if you will, and his blood. And so, again... And I I do understand, I'm not in any way belittling uh, the things that have been done and the issues that are happening. I know I've already mentioned that. But at the same time, listen, guys, when it comes to this issue of slavery in America, let's just, again, I believe the church and every pastor needs to hit this head on. It doesn't do anybody any good to pretend it's not there and not say anything. I think you can overdo it. I think you can underdo it. But the bottom line is this. Is America guilty of the evil of slavery in our past? Absolutely. We can't pretend that didn't happen. We can't pretend that wasn't wrong. But let me say this, when you put it in context, the entire world was involved in slavery in that day. That's all they knew. Listen, when I was growing up, I was a sinner and living openly in sin because I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing until I came to Christ. And then I repented, God forgave me, and now God doesn't hold my past against me. God says, now you're a new creature, move forward. Listen, is there still slavery in America today or did we repent? America repented. Mark, how do you know America repented? How many slaves do you know in America? America repented. We were guilty. We were guilty before God. We were guilty before man, but we've repented. And now we need to be moving forward in the upward call in Christ, not pretending the problems aren't real, not being sensitive to our brothers and sisters and different issues that come up. We have to be honest about this. But at the same time, is America to live forever unforgiven? Let me turn it another way. What if I said, look, I know you came to the Lord, but you'll never be forgiven. I'm going to hold that against you forever. Would that be biblical? No, the Bible says when somebody has forgiveness, what do you do? You forgive them. 
And if America's turned and repented of that, they need to be forgiven of that. Now, there's probably a litany of other sins we could mention and America needs to, to turn away from. I mean, it's interesting. Whatever the world or culture accepts at the time, it seems to be okay. The world was accepting slavery at that time, so everybody seemed like it was okay until our forefathers got convicted, and not only did they repent of it, they went to war to stop it. But now look at today. Is, do you see anything today that's sin against God that's universally accepted in our culture? What about abortion? What about same-sex issues? Yes, I said it from the pulpit. These are things that are being accepted, but the Bible's very clear. This is sin against God. It's sin against God. And yet, because our culture accepts it, everybody's going along. Listen, many of you in the church might think that some of those things are okay. And yet, 50 years from now, they may say, how evil that person could have been to have gone, gone along with that. Listen, I'm not belittling slavery. I'm saying that when someone recognizes their sin, and when someone recognizes they've done wrong, if they repent, we are commanded to forgive them and move on. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this, if you don't forgive your brother, I won't forgive you. That's pretty heavy. So these are heavy things, but again, we have to hit this straight on. And there's a lot of talk today saying, yeah, but you know what? Your forefathers did it, so they should somehow make up for it. Guys, that was four generations ago. And again, if I'm gonna be honest as a pastor, I can't ignore these passages. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers person shall be put to death for his own sin. Jeremiah 31, 29 through 30. In those days, they shall no more say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. You'll be accountable for your sin, not your dad's sin. Ezekiel 18, 20 says this, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. God's word is clear. We're to be accountable for our sin, and we're to be held accountable for our sin. And if we don't repent, God's going to deal with us. Listen, if anybody thinks they've been dealt with unjustly as a people group or even individually, you're not going to escape God's judgment. The Bible says we will all stand before the throne of God, and God will judge each person by the works done in their body, good and bad. Now, as a believer, you won't have your bad judged because it's all been paid for on the cross. You'll just get rewards for the good. But for those who don't know Christ, there's going to be justice. There'll be ultimate justice for all the earth one day. And so we have to realize that. So the bottom line is, though, is that, again, you can't hold other people accountable for the sins of their fathers because they're the ones that are not guilty is what the Lord is saying here. And the measure of a man or a nation is not if they sin, because we all have. The measure is did they ever repent? Did they ever turn from it? I can share my past with you guys. You don't want to know it. Some of you already know my testimony. Um, I don't want to do that. But how sad it would be if somebody made me live there the rest of my life. You know, when I first got saved, Satan tried to do that. He tried to make, always bring up my past. And finally I got to the point saying, you know what? That's my past. You forgave me. I've been washed clean by the blood. I'm moving forward. All the old things have passed away. All things have become new. And if our nation doesn't accept this attitude, I don't know how we're going to get through this. There has to be honesty. Again, this is the church with the understanding. I get that the world's not going to understand that. But the church, above all, has got to realize this. Now, this is why we can celebrate things such as the 4th of July. I can see a lot of people heading into this holiday going, yes, but we're so guilty and we shouldn't be celebrating. Listen, yes, we're guilty, but we're forgiven. Why are we rejoicing? I'm rejoicing because I'm forgiven. I'm rejoicing at the blessing God has done on this nation that although we should have been judged and wiped out by now as a nation, God hadn't done it and God has blessed us. And God has allowed us to live in a very powerful nation, one of the greatest nations to ever exist. And every nation has its sin, every nation. But the Bible says God is the one that exalts a nation and God is the one that brings down a nation. And my fear for America is not because of slavery, because we've repented of that, but because of our new sins, I'm afraid America's on the way down. It's not gonna be slavery that brings down America. It's gonna be America's sin after slavery that brings down America unless we repent. And so... Again, that's why we can celebrate the 4th of July because of what God has done, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's faithfulness to bless us even when we deserve to be judged. And notice next he says that we may have been temporarily taken away. He says, but not in heart. We were always with you. We longed to see you. Remember, we were driven out by those opposing the gospel, he would say to them. Remember, they ran them out of town. He says, but since then, we've been longing to see you. And the language paints a picture of great desire. Paul, Paul's burning to be with them, showing Paul's heart of love and desire for them. You know, I can't claim that I have a heart of love like Paul did for you guys. I love you guys. I don't want to be so bold and say, I love you like Paul did, because to me, that's arrogance. And there's no way. But I do care about you. And you know what? 
seeing you guys, it's so great to see you. Honestly, just to be with you today, this thrills my soul. It really does. It makes me happy. So I get just a small taste of what Paul was saying here. Paul says, I long to be with you. I've been away from you. I want to be restored to you. And so Paul's sharing the heart, showing that these guys are lying about him, not telling the truth. He says in verse 18, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. I tried to, but here's why. Look at this. Satan hindered us. Isn't it interesting to know that Satan can hinder us in the work that we do for the Lord? And even more interesting to know that he can't do it unless God allows him. Now, why would God allow Satan to hinder us? What, what advantage would that be to God and to us? Because oftentimes we're trying to do things that God doesn't want us to do. And sometimes God does want us to do it, but he allows the enemy so that God can show his power to break through and defeat the enemy. So God has his reasons, but this is interesting to me because in Paul's situation here, Paul was hindered from going to them. And because of that, Paul had to write them a letter. Guess what letter he wrote? You're studying it this morning. If Paul had not been hindered by, by, by Satan, he wouldn't have written 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, the whole book. He wouldn't have written it because he wouldn't have had to. He would have been there and you wouldn't have the word of God today in your hands that God wrote through Paul. And what's even more exciting about this is that this, most scholars believe that this was the very first letter that Paul ever wrote, which means this was the beginning of God using Paul to write most of the New Testament or at least 13 books of it. So note this, it's very possible for a fact the hindering of Satan led to this book of 1 Thessalonians, but it's very possible that the hindering of Satan led to most of the New Testament today. Aren't you thankful for the hindering of Satan? Isn't that a different perspective? Listen, God's going to let you do what he wants you to do, and God will break through the enemy when he does it. But if God's going to hinder you, you go back to prayer and say, God, you hindered us. I don't know why you hindered us, but I'll trust you in the midst of that. We've had a lot of hindering. Even this project here we tried to do at Calvary Chapel. You guys know all the hindering that we've had, all the obstacles. You know, we would jokingly say if Noah had had to get a permit, the ark would have never been built. We'd have all drowned. <laughs> right? So I'm thankful that Noah didn't have the, you know, the, the, the same codes and stuff in his day or whatever. You know, you'll need a sprinkler system in that ark, Noah. I said, what? No, we're going to be in the ocean. Well, it don't matter. Anyway. <laughs> but you know what? I trust God in, in what he's done. And God is developing the property beautifully. He's developing the church beautifully. God's doing the work. And so we, we trust God. We say, all right, Lord, whatever you want. I don't want to make my will happen. God forbid that Mark's will happen. You don't need Mark's will, and I don't either. We need God's will. And so hindering sometimes is a good thing. And in this case, it was a good thing. And notice he says 4, verse 19, what is our hope? Or joy, or crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and our joy. You say, look, you're my reward. Why, why in the world would I be trying to do something tricky with you guys? Or you, you're my reward. The fact that I've planted that church, the fact that I poured my life into you, the fact that I'm gonna get I'm gonna get reward for you guys. And he says, So don't let these guys think that I don't love you. You're my reward. Who doesn't love their inheritance? Who doesn't love their reward? You know, you, they read the inheritance at the end of the day, you're going to get a million dollars. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. Why did I get a million dollars? I didn't want a million dollars, right? No, you're going to be, wow, thank you. In other words, what he's saying is, when we invest in each other, guys, you're investing in your heavenly portfolio. You're investing in the kingdom. And Paul wasn't doing it for that. Paul wasn't saying, I'm doing this so that I'll have a lot in heaven. That wasn't his motivation. He said, I'm doing this because I love you, but isn't it great that on top of that, I get reward in heaven? He says, you're my joy. You're my reward. You're my glory. You know, and I'll tell you what that does. That does uh, even if you're doing ministry, if you're doing discipleship, whatever ministry you're in, that's going to give you a heart for those you're ministering to because you're going to realize not only are you pouring into the next generation, not only are you having an impact into people's lives, but the more you pour into them, the more reward there's going to be in heaven because of all you gave and the love that's going to be shared in the kingdom of God. Because we have no idea. You have no idea the impact that you're making right now by sharing with one person and they share with 10 others. You have no idea what you're doing. We have no idea. The prayer time yesterday, the team that was up there praying, you guys that are in this room right now, you have no idea what we did for Knoxville. Now, we didn't do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not patting us on the back. I'm saying by setting aside the time to go pray for our city and pray for our state and pray for our leaders and do these things, when we do this, we get blessed. And we may not even know it. We may not even realize until we get there what God has done. I was talking to Tracy yesterday. We were eating together and the conversation came up about God doing stuff for us that we don't even know. How many times has God done things for us we don't even know? And he's saved our life or he's done something. He does everything for us, right? I wonder how many times your prayers 
and your ministry has affected the people of Knoxville and changed their lives, and you didn't even know it. You're going to know it one day. You're going to be standing before the Lord. He's going to begin to show you your reward and what you're getting reward for. You say, what? You mean that's how we prayed for that and that happened? You're kidding. No, and here's your reward. You Really? Guys, that's, that's your joy and your glory, the ministry that you do for the Lord and the fact that you pour into each other and pour your life into each other. How much time do we have left? Well, Mark, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. That's true. I believe it's going to be soon, but we don't know. The Lord said, no one knows the day or the hour, but here's what I do know. Every day I wake up, I realize I'm going here. I'm going there pretty quick, right? More things break, more things ache. You know that achy, breaky heart song? It's like, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a description to me, right? Remember one of my pastor friends said, I knew I'd go to heaven. I just didn't think it'd be one piece at a time. <laughs> so here's the bottom line. Whether he comes back quick or not, we're going to him very quickly. We're going to him very shortly. Are you ready? Number one, have you received Christ? Are you ready to stand before the Lord? Because it could be today. It's not a scare tactic. I'm speaking truth. It could be today. We don't know. But at the same time, are you using your time wisely? What are you doing for the kingdom? It doesn't mean you have to be a pastor. You don't have to be involved in church ministry. Listen, the Bible said, whatever you do in any occupation that God has called you, God has gifted everyone in this room for what he's called you to do. That's your ministry. It's the people in the cubicle around you. It's the people that you're working among. That's your ministry. You don't have to be a, you know, I'm not going to get reward because of this. No, God's going to probably judge those that are involved in ministry more strictly because that's all they were doing, right? Do what God has called you to do where you are and do it as unto the Lord. Let's count our days. Let's number our days. Let's be ready for the return of the Lord and let's use our time wisely. And so Paul says, you are our joy and our glory. I want to encourage you on a couple things today. First of all, as we finish up here, if you feel that Satan's been hindering you, there's nothing wrong in praying for God to stop it. There's nothing wrong in praying for God to help you understand it, but you also need to make sure, God, is this your will? Are you letting the enemy hinder me because you don't want me to do this or is this just battle? See, there's two sides of this coin. Don't just give up because there's a closed door. That might mean God wants you to kick it down in prayer. But if that door stays closed and you keep kicking, you might want to go back to prayer and say, God, am I kicking against the goads here? Is this, am I supposed to stop? You show me, Lord, and you lead me. So don't, don't be concerned about that. Take it to the Lord. And lastly, celebrate in our repentance as a nation. Celebrate in the promise of God if we turn from our sin and turn to God. Celebrate in the blessings that God has poured out on this nation because God has blessed us abundantly. Guys, we're one of the few nations in the world that builds walls to keep people out. Most other nations build walls to keep people in. Why is that? Because everybody wants to come here. Why? Because they know it's a blessed nation. I'm not getting political. I'm simply stating a fact. God has blessed this nation. I don't know how long that, that blessing is going to last. I'm not sure how much longer we have to go. I'm concerned about where America's headed. And we're seeing the fruit, I think, in our nation in many different areas by turning away from God. Removing the Bible from schools in 1963. Removing prayer from schools in 1962. And to see what's happened to our nation since those times, it's amazing. That's a whole other study in and of itself. But there's a real correlation to that and what's been happening in our nation. We need God. We need to turn back to God as a nation, and it's got to start with the church. Remember, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their sin and their wicked ways and, and repent and turn to heaven, humble themselves, God says, I'll heal their, heal their land. We need to set the example. We've got to be the ones repenting. We've got to be the ones loving each other. And we've got to be that shining light to the world around us because Jesus is the only hope and we're his representatives. Amen. The New Testament letters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are good reminders that people in the past had the same concerns as many might have today. There can be an uncertainty of what's to come and when everyone starts to speculate, it gets tricky to discern what's true and what's not. If you're finding yourself becoming stagnant in your faith, this book is like drinking some fresh water as it brings about the right perspective on Christ's return and what that means for those who are followers of Jesus. If you aren't familiar with this kind of faith and are wondering what it means to become a follower of Jesus, don't hesitate to ask us any questions. You can connect at thewaymedia.net by clicking on the Come to the Table section or give our church office a call at 865-609-1385. Again, that number is 865-609-1385. If you're in the Knoxville area, please come to get to know us at Calvary Knoxville. We meet every Sunday and would be excited to hear your story. Simply go to thewaymedia.net and find the Calvary Knoxville link to get service times and directions. If these teachings have been helpful for you and you'd like to hear more from this series and the letters to the Thessalonians, we encourage you to find them on thewaymedia.net. We'd be happy to have you join us for our next edition. Keep reading through God's Word until we again come to the table.
Come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.